As we begin our service, we're going to read from Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the Lord, so the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Let's pray. Father, we just have so much to be thankful for. We're thankful that we get to be here right now in your presence. We're thankful that we are joined together. There are so many different people in here and so many different backgrounds. And, and Lord, you have brought us together to be one church and to be, have one mind. We get to praise you as, as one body this morning, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for all the workings in our lives you've done. We thank you for the encouragement you've given this week. We thank you for the blessings you've given each and every one of us this week. Lord, we pray for those that may be hurting right now, may be grieving right now. Lord, would you just give them peace? Would you give them the hope that only you can give? Lord, as we continue on with this, this service, Lord, we pray that you be praised in every way. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our souls this morning, that your word will reach every dark corner of our hearts. Lord, I pray that we will leave here with a new desire of, of obedience to you. Lord, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's all stand and worship together. The name of the Lord, 
Come into your house and worship you. Thank you, Lord, that you are our everything 
Amen. Hallelujah.
not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, yet not I, but through Christ. In me, one last time. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about. Sure. 
Welcome back, I should say. I want to give a little warning. As I was writing this sermon this week, I think this may be the longest sermon I've ever written. So I don't know what that means because Hank told me I had all the way till noon to preach. I, what? Is that not right? No. <laughs> no, there... There is a lot to cover this week. We are uh, back in Joshua. We're in Joshua 9. And it, it was one of those, those sermons that as I was writing, it just kind of kept going. Not because there's just so much happening going on. There's a lot of characters going on. So uh, we're going to be in Joshua 9 if you want to go ahead and turn there. Our, our passage this morning is a pivotal chapter in the book of Joshua. Things start changing a little bit, as we're going to see in, a, in, a, in just a moment uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of new characters kind of coming into the story that, that's unfolding for us. Um, and you know, we're right off the heels of Joshua 8, where Joshua renewed the covenant with the people. And every time that happens in the scriptures, you're, you're always thinking, okay, they got it. They're back on track. They're going to they're gonna move forward. They're going to do things right. And if you've read the book of Judges, you know that usually turns out the opposite. They usually, you know, they, they, they make this commitment and then pew, they go down to the end. So uh, we, we, we kind of come to, the, to chapter 9, and there's a lot in this chapter. There's a lot of context that calls us to, to know what's going on in the Pentateuch. We're, we're called to know the book of the law well to, to understand this passage correctly. And uh, we have to think about what's happened in the previous few chapters. And so remember with me, as we uh, look at some previous chapters, we, we remember that we, we saw under Joshua's leadership that they've, they've come into the promised land and they've had victory after victory. Uh, we've already seen them defeat Jericho in chapter six. And in the defeat of Jericho, we, we re remember that Rahab was, was spared from that, that she uh, professed that knowledge in the God, and she, she said, I, I want to be, I want to be with that God. I want, I want your God to be my God. Uh, you can see Rahab switches, switches sides as you would have it, and her family is saved. And then we saw that, that Israel went forward and defeated Ai in chapter 8. Uh, then, of course, we were saddened to hear about the fact that there was sin um, in chapter 7, and that's where we see the sin of Achan, and we saw the earlier defeat of Israel at Ai, and then we see the eventual victory. 
And so we see all of those things take place, and we come to the covenant renewal that we see in chapter, uh, at the end of chapter 8, and all those things are going to kind of play into what we see here in chapter 9. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to read the whole passage together, uh, but before I read, would you join me in prayer? Father, we're just so thankful for your word. Lord, as we, as we open up your word this morning, I pray that your words will go forth. Lord, whatever is said this morning, may it be your words. Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit is uh, living and active and working in the hearts of every single person here. Lord, I pray that that you will give me the strength needed to to proclaim your word this morning. I pray that you will be with each and every soul and each and every heart here that is hearing your word being preached. Lord, I pray that your word will pierce those hearts. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today will be that day. Lord, I pray that you will reveal their sinfulness to him, reveal their need for a Savior, and reveal the love that you have for them through Jesus Christ dying for them on the cross. Lord, for all those in here who who are believers, who have come to faith in Christ already, Lord, let us be encouraged by your word this morning. Let us be lifted up. Let us have a, a new sense of love for your word and for who you are. Lord, help us to leave here with a renewed pledge of obedience to you. Above all, Lord, I pray that you are glorified in this place this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, follow along with me as I read. Um, We're going to read all of Joshua 9 together. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country, in the lowland, all along the coast of the great sea, toward Lebanon, the, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended with worn out and patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and they said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us, then how can we make a covenant with you? They said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. We have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all of our inhabitants in all of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them and behold, they have burst. All these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chephra, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, let them live so they may become cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation just as the leaders had said to them. Joshua summoned them, and he said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying we are very very far from you when you dwell among us? Now therefore you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, Because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your, 
in your sight, do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of, the land, out of the hand of the people of Israel. They did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. To this day, in that place, he should choose. It's the word of our Lord. So we see here in chapter 9, there is a lot going on. And there's some things that have, have changed in regard to our previous few chapters. So as soon as we begin this chapter, we are greeted with all these other cities, all these other kings, and how they are perceiving what is happening with Israel and with, and with their people. And so we, we have this in, in, in verse 1 and 2. We see that they're all coming together, all these, all these kings. They hear about what's going on. They come together and say, let's fight. Let's join together and fight. Now, we haven't seen that up to this point. We have seen them, Israel, go up to a city, fight that city, go to the next city, fight that city. Um, sometimes it wasn't much of a fight, and we've seen that go forth, and now we see that these kings have heard all about what's happened. They've rationalized it in their minds and they said, well, I, I, well, let's join together. Wouldn't it be smarter if we joined together? And they made a resolve to fight. This is, an, is a very different approach. Not only the, the coalition of kings coming together, but a willingness to want to fight Israel. We've not seen that happen. We've seen so far as Israel has come into the promised land, we've seen that the people have been filled with fear. They've heard all about what's happened in Egypt. They've heard all about the God of Israel bringing them all the way out of Egypt into the promised land, and they've seen the might and the power of the God of Israel, and no one has wanted anything to do with them. Now all of a sudden, these kings are saying, yeah, let's fight. Let's join together. We got this. Let's fight. We, we're going to hold our ground here. This is our land. They can't come into our land and fight us. So we have to ask ourselves, what's changed? What has changed in the course of what has happened to get to here? And the answer is sin. Sin has happened. And that brings us to our first point this morning. There will always be effects with sin, and many times your sin will affect someone else. I am not an English major, so that is the wrong E and A on those effects just don't tell me, okay? That's how we're going to do that. Um, that's how that works. So sin has come in. We, we, we went in our review, we talked about the sin of Achan. The sin of Achan that led to the defeat of Israel at Ai, we see that that sin is still hanging around. It's still wrecking havoc for the people of Israel. It's still causing them difficulty in life. But we also see that that sin has changed the opinion of Israel and Israel's God to the people that they're around. Israel was supposed to make their God known to the nations. Israel was supposed to be a chosen people set apart to where when you saw Israel, you were supposed to be a representation of the God that they serve. We are like that too. If you remember, we are to be many Christ. As Christians, we are to be a representation of Christ in our lives. Uh, so before we get too harsh on Israel, you know, we have to think about our own selves too. But we see that this sin has, uh, the sin of one man, Achan, was credited all. We saw that uh, in chapter 7 that, that, there were, that there were already effects of this. We saw Israel lose a battle, uh, which is, is no small thing. People lost their lives in this battle. And so we don't want to take that lightly. But we, now we see something different. All the other kings who were watching what was playing out all they saw was someone who they thought was unbeatable, they now see as beatable. Because as, as they got a, a one defeat in, they said, okay, that there must be a weakness there. In, in sports, we see this happen all the time when, when you have a, the defending state champion who's undefeated, sometimes multi-years in a row, and it seems like there is no way this team can lose. And when you have to play that team, you're already kind of cowering in fear, like, there's, there's nothing we can do. We've watched game film. That, that team beat us by 20, and we've got to play the team that beat them by 20. And you, you're just, you feel defeated before it even happens. But what happens when you're scheduled to play that team and the team right before you beats them? Then you're kind of like, okay, wait a minute here. What did they do? Okay, they did this, so there must be a, there's an opening here. I'm, I can know, oh, okay, that guy can't shoot worth a lick. We'll just kind of all go to him all the time. Uh, and so you get a game plan, you find their weakness, you can analyze things, and it gives you hope to know that you can have victory. 
And so this is what's happening here, that uh, the people no longer see Israel as this, as this threat that they, that they thought they were. They no longer believe that the God of Israel was possibly as powerful as, as they first thought, as they, were, as they were learned to believe. And so we see that the sin of, of this one man, Achan, has caused the, the nations, the other cities, the other kings, the other rulers, we saw them to now have an, an incomplete view of who God is. The representation of who God is through the Israelites was now a false view. They, they, don't, they don't believe rightly about God now. They don't think rightly about who God is because of the representation that was there for, for them. And before we move on, I think we should reflect on that a little bit. When we think about our own lives, do we, do we think about the fact that our sin might, might affect other people? Do we think about the fact that, our, that there's going to be effects to our sin? I, I know that for a fact there are that is true. It's a true thing in life. And I think it's something that if we were kind of to dwell on a little bit, that it would kind of make us think twice about our actions. It would kind of make us think, okay, my behavior, the way I, the way I act in this instance, it could, it could affect other people's lives. I, have, I, I know people in, in, um, from older friendships that, that they no longer have access to their kids because of decisions that they've made, sinful things that they made. They, they've lost their kids because of it. They lost that relationship, and, or maybe it's gotten shortened. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the structure of the family, it's really easy to see, if, okay, now if, if I react abruptly right here, if I, if I get mad and I get angry, and I lose my temper here, one of those effects could be my kids are going to learn that then they can do that. This is an appropriate way to behave. And so as we do life, we know that we don't want to sin, right? No one in here is like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good with sinning. I'm going I'm to do that some more. Uh, we don't want to sin. And sometimes that might be a good approach to us as we, as we think through things is to, to, to kind of have a, a, a second to pause and say, okay, is this action wrong? And what are, what are the consequences for that action? We're constantly telling our kids there's always a consequences for your actions. And I think when we do that in our life, if we, if we pause and we reflect on things, we might save ourselves from some other headaches down the road of what that thing could cause. It's a sobering uh, truth in this world, and it's good for us to be reminded of it. So that's what's happening here in Joshua 9. Um, that's, that's the approach of several kings, but that's not the approach of, of everybody. Let's continue in verse 3. We see that uh, Gibeon, a, a, city, a city that's not far from, from where the Israelites are at, they don't respond that way. Uh, their response is not, hey, let's join up with the other Canaanites and, and fight. Their response is, uh, let's, pl- let's hatch a plan. I, I still see what God has done. I still see what the Israelites have done. And I don't know that fighting is the best approach. I think if we fight, uh, it's not going to turn out so well. I remember when I was in grade school, the kids in school used to fight at the mound. Does anybody remember that? I don't know why I remember that. I, I made somebody mad one day. And you got to remember, I was like this big, in grade, this big in grade school and junior high. Okay, that's how big I was. And I, I had made somebody mad. I don't remember who it was, but it was somebody who was like this big, and I was this big, and I was like, hey, we're going to fight at the mound after school. I don't know why. I mean, there was people around. It's, it's PE. You know, there's other boys around. You can't, you can't say no, right? But I knew, I knew I would get destroyed if we fought after school. <laughs> Number one, I had never punched anything in my life except maybe my pillow. So it was not going to. So I spent the whole rest of the day like, hey, man, this is silly. This is silly. Like, we don't want to fight, do we? Aren't we like buddies? I don't even remember who it was, but I, and it, I ended up weaseling my way out of the fight, and we didn't, we didn't fight, but I knew I had no chance, and so I had to take a different approach, and I didn't really get to deceive anybody, but I knew that I was not going to go in, and we were not going to have that fist fight, because it would have ended badly for me, um, and I would have gotten in trouble at home, and that is not, not good either. So we didn't fight, and, we, and so Gibeon's thinking the same thing. They don't think they have a chance. They're trying to, to get a new plan, and so they, they hatched this plan of deceitfulness and deception to kind of get out of this. And so if you look at this section of Scripture, you can see that they hatched this plan, and they, they're going to they're gonna prepare themselves in such a way that it looks like they came from a long way away. They put on old clothes, old tattered clothes, worn-out sandals, 
Uh, so, when, so when they show up, it looks like, oh man, we've been walking for days and days and months. And then they, they put new wine, or they put, they take an old wine skin, so it looks like it burst in the journey. They bring um, old, crusty, crumbly bread, because everybody likes eating old, crusty, crumbly bread. And they, and they say, well, w- this was warm when we brought it. And see, that's how long we've been walking. And so they got this plan to deceive the Israelites because honestly, they feel like this is their only option of survival. They feel like this is the only way that they can save their lives is to, to deceive them. And so they, they do this. Now, now, why would they do that? Well, to know why they did that, we have to read a little bit of the covenant back in Deuteronomy. So this is Deuteronomy 20, uh, 10 through 18. And it begins talking about the cities that are outside of the promised land. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And the Lord your God gives it into your hand. You shall put all its males to the sword, but the women, the little ones, the livestock, and everything else in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as plunder for yourselves. And you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do all to the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities in the nations here. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you, you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. Remember this list of names here, of, of, of uh, nationalities here. The, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable places that they have done for their gods, so you sin against the Lord your God. It's interesting that that list in Deuteronomy 20 is the exact same list that we see here in Joshua 9. Um, there's a lot of lists in the, in the Pentateuch, but this is one where it exactly matches up. So Israel is permitted to make a covenant with people that are outside of the promised land. So, they, so somehow the people of Gibeon know so much about God, but they also know a lot about the covenant. They also know about all of the, all of the commands that God gave Moses. They know that if they pretend to be a nation outside of the promised land, then, then it is right for Israel to make peace with them, to make a covenant with them, to not fight with them, to join together. However, this covenant also says that the Israelites were not to make any covenants with the people of Canaan. So the people that they're neighbors with, the people who they live with, who are in the promised land, in the, in the land of Canaan, they are not to make any covenants with. The people of Israel are not to make any covenants with them. They are uh, devoted to destruction uh, because it is the land that God has promised them. So the Gibeonites here, we see, they have a lot of knowledge of Israel. They know all about their past dealings, and they even know about the law of God. And so we don't exactly know how they know that, but it's interesting because as we saw in, in, the, in the earlier text that, that the chosen people, God's chosen people, are to make God known throughout the world. And so it's interesting here to come to a passage where we see that God is becoming known throughout the world. They may not know him rightly, they may not know him well, but his presence and who he is is becoming known throughout all the nations. And there is something that people have to then deal with. Who, who is this God and what am I going to do about it? And so the Gibeonites are wrestling with that right now. So these people come in, they have their tattered clothes, they have all of this stuff, and they come up and um, they ask Joshua and the leaders of, of the Israelites, and they say, hey, we are from a distant country and we want to make a covenant with you. We've heard about your God. Uh, we're your servants. We want to make peace with you. We want... We want to, to make a covenant. Well, it says that the people are, are initially skeptical, right? You can see in your text that, uh, you know, when they come in, they don't just automatically say yes. <clears throat> we see Joshua says, um, says, who are you? Where, where do you come from? And so there is an initial skepticism of like, okay, we need to at least like, hey, hey, are, are you really from somewhere else? You know, do you, where do you live? You know, who are you? What, what is your tribe? What is your background? You know, who are you associated with? And, and of course, they respond uh, in, a, in a not true way. And they say, well, we're from a distant country that you're a serpent. We've come from a, a distant country. And so we don't know how long this takes place, but we, we, know, we see that the, there are some questions asked. 
But it's interesting as we continue on in the scriptures, if we see in, in uh, verse seven, the narrator of this text says, but the men of Israel said to the Hivites. We know they're from Gibeon, but now the text calls them Hivites. And that's interesting because if we look at the list that we see in the first two verses, we see that the Hivites are actually a people group that are supposedly devoted to destruction. So the narrator is telling us, okay, these people are lying. These people are deceiving you. These people are actually right here from among us. But of course, we're outside the story, right? So we're out here, we see what's going on, but the people in the story don't know what's going on. So they make the covenant with them? They do. Joshua, the, the, the leaders of, of Israel make the covenant with them and, and Joshua grants them peace even though, even though they were skeptical. They take, their, they take their word for it. They take what they say and they say, okay, well, you, you're not from here. You say you're not from here. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make this peace treaty with you. We're gonna make a covenant with you. Um, and and they, they, they hear what they're saying but they also took their, their possessions. They took, their, they took that crumbly bread and said, yep, it does look like crumbly bread. This is bread that I would not want to eat. So they took, their, they took their provisions and said, it all matches up. It all matches up. So <clears throat> they, they make the peace with the, the people. They make their covenant. And this, this, this leads us to something that I think we can learn from. Because what we see here is there's one important part of this end of the story. It says that they did not ask counsel from the Lord. So they did their due diligence in asking questions to the, to the Gibeonites. They did their due diligence by taking the provisions and inspecting them and, and doing this. But what they did not do is they did not ask counsel from the Lord. They didn't take the time, even though there may have been busy things happening in, these people may have walked a long way, they may have been trying to take care of it right away. They didn't take the time to say, Lord, what is your will in this situation? Lord, what would you have us do here? They didn't, they didn't take that, that necessary step. So they move forward with the covenant and they make peace with them. And I think there's a lesson here for this. There's, there's so many good lessons throughout this text that fit into the main theme of the text that we're gonna see. But good discernment includes seeking the Lord's counsel. We need to have good discernment in this life. As we are walking around, as we're doing life together, we're gonna be having decisions all the time that we have to make, some hard, some easy. We need to be asking the Lord's help for those decisions. Now, I'm not saying every decision you make has to have a little prayer with it, although I'm not saying it's bad either. Now, if you go to the ice cream shop later and you're like, hmm, chocolate or vanilla, I don't think you necessarily have to pray about chocolate or vanilla. You know, God's given us wisdom, he's given us knowledge, he's given us the ability to make decisions, right? But there are times in your life you're like, I don't know. I don't know about this, this job that I'm, I've been approached with. I don't, I'm, I'm struggling with my marriage. I'm struggling with my, my family, my finances. I'm, I've, I've got medical decisions that I don't even know what to do. The Lord wants us to seek his counsel on that. The Lord wants us to go to him. He knows our ways better than we do. He knows what's best for us. We want to know his will on those matters. And so when, when we're doing life and we're doing things we need to remember that to, to have good discernment in life, to, to have good knowledge about making decisions and make good decisions, we need to include the Lord. We need to go to the Lord in prayer and seek his counsel on matters in our lives. Because if not, then we're leaving it up to our own, our own ways. We're leaving it up to our own knowledge and our own will of what's going on. And I don't I think I have to give examples, but if I did, you would know that it doesn't always turn out well. If we lean on our own understandings, it's not going to turn out well for us. We need to trust the Lord. We need to go to him. We need to seek his counsel. It's a good lesson for us to learn as we learn this from Joshua and the leaders here. But let's see how it plays out for them. They've used their own, uh, whatever they had in front of them. They've taken that for, for what it's worth. They didn't seek the Lord's counsel and they make a decision. Let's see how that works out. Well, in verse 16, we see that at the end of three days, Three days is not a very long time. At the end of three days, they find out that the Gibeonites are actually their neighbors. So three days is not a very long time to find out, which makes me think that this would have been really easy to investigate, that if the Lord said, pause, find more information out, 
they, they would have been able to find the information pretty easily. The city of Gibeon is only like five or six miles from where they were. They were going to find out. They were, as they were going through the promised land, they were going to get there. But they didn't wait. They were too busy with what they were doing. They wanted to take care of it themselves. They didn't seek the Lord's counsel. So now they have, the, the people of Israel have made a covenant with a people that they were not supposed to make a covenant with. We know they were allowed to make covenants with people outside of the promised land, but these people were inside the promised land. So at this point, maybe many of you are probably thinking what I'm thinking. Well, the con- it should be like null and void, right? I mean, the one party lied. I mean, if I make a contract with someone and that party lies about what their services are, or what they can offer, or, you know, I'm, I'm nulling that contract out, right? Well, that's not how a covenant works in the Old Testament. A covenant was made by swearing an oath to the Lord their God. That is not broken. When you swear an oath to God, you're, that's not something that you're going to take lightly. It's not something that you're going to break, even if the other side of the covenant does, does fail on their end. We should be thankful for that because we are in a covenant with, with our God and we sometimes fail on our side, but God never fails to uphold his, his side of the covenant. He is faithful and he is just and he is working in us every single moment or every single day. So we see here, and according to the Old Testament, they're gonna have to make a choice. They made a covenant with people they shouldn't have made it. They can either break the covenant, which would be against their law, it would be against the Old Testament law, it would be, it'd be breaking a covenant with God, or they can honor the covenant they made. This is a case where, where two wrongs don't make a right. Right? We always tell people that two wrongs don't make a right. If they were to break the covenant, they would, be, they would be lying against God. They would be doing something against God's will. And so to do that, um, they would be facing the wrath of God on them. And so they choose to do what is right here. They choose to honor their covenant. They choose to, do, uh, <clears throat> to uphold what they have promised. This is the right thing for them to do. They've, they've made a mistake and then they're, they're doing the right thing now. This is, this is the right way to move forward. Um, and let me tell you, in our lives, there's times where when we sin, it sometimes seems like the way to get, to get out of that sin is to do another sin, right? If you've ever told a lie and got caught in that lie, what did you have to do to get out of that lie? What did you feel like you had to do? Tell another lie, Right? Well, I got caught here, so, I, oh, well, what I meant to say was, uh, uh, I, I, I meant, meant to do this. And, and so we, we, we do something or say something to try to get ourselves out of the first little conundrum we're in and try to save ourselves when the right answer the second time, no matter what the consequences might bring, the right answer was to say, I'm sorry, but I lied. I need to ask for your forgiveness in that. That's the harder thing, but it's the right thing to do. And so when, we're, when we are in a point where we've sinned, and we're now faced with the consequences for our actions, the best thing we can do is to accept those consequences and go back to the right track with obeying God and obeying the things that he's done for us. The people aren't happy about it, but the leaders remind them that the wrath of God will be upon them if they break their their covenant. So the leaders say, okay, well, we're gonna make this covenant with you. They're gonna be cutters of wood and drawers of water. That actually is in accordance with with the, the text of, of, in the Old Testament of what they, they would do when they brought people in from other nations. But this does lead us to main point number two. God's mercy is available for those that deserve destruction. That is a beautiful truth in the scriptures because anyone who has sinned against God deserves destruction. Anyone who has sinned against God deserves his wrath, deserves punishment, but God's mercy is available for everyone. The Gibeonites were marked for destruction and they end up living. They end up getting mercy from the Israelites and from the Israelite and from God. After the truth comes out, Joshua calls the Gibeonites over and says, why, why did you lie to us? Why, why did you lie? And they, they tell the truth. They say they heard, they heard about the God of Israel and they feared for their lives. So they may not have had a, a complete view of who God is, but they knew that God was powerful. They knew that their God was faithful. They knew that their God was just. Their God kept their word. And they, they, they rationalized all that out and they thought the only way to save their lives was to do, do deception. And so they feared. Out of fear, they did these things. Matthew, Matthew Henry sums it up like this. He says, 
They considered that God's sovereignty is incontestable, his justice inflexible, his power irresistible, and therefore resolved to try what his mercy was and found out it was not in vain to cast themselves upon it. They felt their only choice was to test, to see if, to see if the God of Israel had mercy. They knew about his power. They knew about everything else about him that they could tell. They didn't know, is, is this a merciful God? In church, we worship a merciful God. When we throw ourselves on his feet, he is, gives mercy to us. He forgives us of our sins, and he brings us in to his family. And so we see that the Gibeonites receive God's mercy. Uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't just give them uh, mercy because they, they, they had this good plan. God doesn't look down and say, well, that was a, pretty, was a pretty good plan. I mean, you guys, I mean, the wineskins, great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have mercy on you. It's not because of their actions. It's in spite of their actions. In their sin, God shows mercy on them. God's grace continues as we keep going through the, through the text here. See that Joshua doesn't just save their life. He puts them in a position to see the glory of God. We saw that the leaders of the congregation said they're gonna be cutters of wood and drawers of water. But then Joshua adds to that. He says that they're going to do that for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. The altar of the Lord is the central place of the sacrificial system. So every time a, a sin offering was placed, every time someone wanted to come and meet with the Lord, it would have been the place the tabernacle would have been brought. All those things would have taken place there. And so Joshua sets these people, these Gibeonites, who have, a, have an incomplete view of who God is, they're not sure what to make of, of this God of Israel. He puts them in a position that they get to see atonement for sin happen on a daily basis. They get to be up close and personal with the workings of people coming and worshiping God, people coming to, to make their lives right with God and to making a, a sacrifices happen. Joshua sets the Gibeonites up on a path here of redemption. He set them up on a path where they get to see God rightly. They get to see who God really is. And then as they're doing that, they're going to be processing their own lives. They're going to be processing, okay, who is this God? We now know all this about God. We now know he's a God of mercy. Praise the God that has mercy on us. And so Joshua wants them to see and take rightly about who God is. So what about us in this chapter? As we, as we walk through this text together, what, how do we see ourselves here? Well, one time or another, we had an incomplete view of who God is. We thought wrongly about God. And, and, and this is probably gonna impact people in different ways, but for, for some of us in here, there may be a time when, when we heard about who God was or, or we didn't care about who God was. Maybe we wanted to run. We wanted to run away from that. We didn't want anything to do with religion, God, the people of God. We wanted to run away from that. Maybe we wanted to fight. Maybe we were combative towards the gospel. Maybe we didn't know what to do, so we just hid. Maybe we didn't know what to do with it, so we just... We played the part. We acted righteous. We acted right. At some point, we all were Gibeonites in this way. We all were people who were estranged from God. We were all people who, who did not know God rightly. And then God shows himself to us through his word, through the gospel presentation from somebody we know. We learned that in our sin, Christ died for us exactly where we were, who we were, no matter how bad or messed up we were, God's mercy was greater than that. God gave so much mercy to us every single day that he forgave us of our sin. And just like the Gibeonites were brought in, they were given peace, they were given life, they were brought in and they lived amongst the chosen people of God, we have been adopted by God and brought into his family. The inheritance that we receive is the inheritance that Jesus has. That should be, give us much to be thankful for. Maybe you're here this morning and you're looking at your life and you're thinking, man, I've messed it up. I've done this, I've done that, I've done so many things. You can't believe what all I've done. I don't care. God doesn't care. God wants to meet you where you are and he wants to bring you through those things. He wants to, to shower you with the love that he has. He showed how much he loved you by sending Christ to the cross for your sins. So no matter who you are this morning, whether you're, whether you're, you're a Christian You've been a believer for a long time. We can take hold of this truth and we can take it and it can change how we live our lives. If you're not a Christian here and you don't know where to go, the answer is the Lord. Jesus wants you to know 
the love he has for you. Mercy is available. He can take a story of deception and he can turn it into redemption. And he can do the same thing for every single person in this room. I want to, I want to leave you with the rest of the story as we close this morning. We're going to read from 1 Kings 3 and I, I want you to see the ending of the story. This is 1 Kings 3, starting in verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings to the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give to you. And we're going to skip down. We're going to skip down to where it says, give your servant. This is Solomon's request to God. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? In a twist of irony, Gibeon actually becomes the allotment for Benjamin as Joshua divides the land. It becomes a great high place. It's a place that is set for worship. It's a set place. It's a high place. It becomes a place of worship for the people of Israel, this city that was marked for destruction. And so we see many, many years later, King Solomon comes, and he comes to offer sacrifices in Gibeon. And he says, and, he, and the Lord says, what do you want? What can, you, what can I give you? And Solomon famously asked for wisdom. At Gibeon, the place where the Israelites did not seek God's counsel, Solomon does seek God's counsel, and he says, I want your wisdom. I want to be able to discern between good and evil. And this, 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 this fun twist of, of, of irony that we get to see, that this covenant that was made with Israel and Gibeon was never broken. It continued on. In First Chronicles 12, we see that David's mighty men contained Ishmael, the Gibeonite, a mighty warrior who had 30 people under him, in Nehemiah 7, we see that 95 men of Gibeon return out of Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem. When Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem a thousand years after Joshua, men from Gibeon helped with the construction of that. We serve a good God. We serve a, we serve a merciful God who keeps his promises. He is faithful. He was completely faithful to the Gibeonites. He was completely faithful to his people of, of Israel. He had a plan of redemption for the Gibeonites that no one knew. It had involved a start of deception. God never in the scriptures okays the deception. The thing that he calls out in Joshua 9 is, the, is, the, is Joshua and the leaders not right doing and forgetting to go to the Lord. That's what is called out in Joshua 9 is, is for not doing that. But we see Joshua 9, there's so many good lessons here but above all of those lessons is that our God is a God of mercy and that mercy is available for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for your mercy. God, you have been so good to us. Lord, we thank you for that reminder of your goodness today. We're thankful for that reminder of your faithfulness today. Lord, you are faithful to us when we are not faithful to you. Lord, you are good to us when we are not good to you. Lord, each and every day, we, we want to honor you, we want to glorify you, we want to, we want to obey you in all things. And Lord, when we fall, Lord, we're just so thankful that you forgive us of that, that you have mercy on us for that. Lord, as we, as we take this scriptures and we take it out of this room, Lord, help us to want to, to have more people understand your mercy. The Gibeonites needed to be reminded of who God is. They needed to see him rightly. And Lord, the people who we are around need to see you well. They need to see who God is. And Lord, help us be that instrument. Help us be a good witness to you as we leave this place. Lord, as we sing this last song, help us to sing it loudly, knowing that Jesus does love each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I seem to be joined on stage at this point. <laughs> this is our, our closing song. And what we would like to do here is we're going to have the uh, children's group lead this time of worship. And so this is our closing song where we're going to uh, be.
be dismissed at a time of praise and, and song. So we're going to ask you to go ahead and stand together as, as our children uh, lead the congregation in song this morning. Please join them as they sing, Jesus Loves Me. Can you hear me? I think that we could all probably say that one of the first people, persons to teach us this song was our grandparents. So um, it also is probably some of the first times that we have ever heard the gospel proclaimed in something that seems so simple and so little, but the words are actually so deep and true. So they are going to lead you in worship as we close out today. Ready? We start with Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Isn't that great? I don't even want to say anything, but I will. <laughs> what I love about songs like that is, and grandparents, you can attest to this, those stick with you in a way that they don't just minister to children, right? They minister to you throughout life. And I don't know about you, and, and I'll, I'll get my British impression going on here. Like, is, we have this idea, many of us, we live with this idea like God is angry and so, like, if you're British, you would say, God has wrath for you, right? He's got wrathful. He's coming down. And so this guy, this British guy, he was struggling with this word wrath, because we say wrath in the States, all right? And, and sometimes you draw it out. He's, he's wrathful, right? Well, God's got wrath for you. He's wrathful. He's wrath, wrath. 
God is angry. <laughs> That's what this man said at this conference. He's not angry with you. Okay? This is the point. You don't have to convince somebody that God is angry with them. A lot of people know that. But convincing them that Jesus loves them, that's not always easy to do. But songs like this are good reminders of that wonderful, glorious truth. God is not angry. God loves you through Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Amen? Thank you, kids. Can we give them another round of applause? Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Adam. Good word, brother. I'm going to let you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.